because you didn't hear it on a radio show. You don't understand what I said to you? Hey, moderate bastard. Uh, okay, I, you know, this is the problem. You've got people who are brainwashed. They listen to other people. Then they call your show with the other. They regurgitate like birds. They regurgitate what they think they learned to sound smart on the radio. The wife left them a long time ago. They're left alone with a cat. They got nothing to do with listening to talk radio. Regurgitate. Donald Trump is not a conservative who passes the muster of all of the wonderful folks at the National Review. Those, for example, who once shined William F. Buckley Jr.'s suits and pressed his coats. But the fact of the matter is, you may not know this about old William F. Buckley Jr., but go research this and see if I'm wrong, all you uh, National Review types. He said the important thing is to win. Did you know that? Did you know that William F. Buckley Jr. said, let's win? He understood what pragmatism meant. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's wonderful to be a purist. It's wonderful to stand on a high horse and say you're better than everybody else. But it's really more wonderful to save your nation by winning an election every once in a while instead of throwing it under the, uh, throw it in, in the garbage because you're so perfect. Anyway, that's the story. If you care to join the conversation, 855-407-282. WABC, Tommy, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's your topic, Tommy? Hey, doing, Mike. Uh, I disagree. I, I agree with you on the outbreak of diseases on uh, uh, the immigrants. My, my sister picked up scabies at uh, an emergency room, taking my brother-in-law. He had a stroke. Uh, and when she went to the doctors, she, the doctor told her that there's an outbreak of scabies in all the emergency rooms out on the east end of Long Island. <laughs> oh, sure. Well, look, th this is part of the beauty of uh, liberalism and immigration. They bring with us all of their diseases, all of their cultural mores, uh, all of the hygienic uh, uh, advances that they have in the third world. And that's why I wrote Diseases Without Borders, my friend. It's up on michaelsavage.com only at 30 minutes ago. Diseases Without Borders, back in a minute on the Savage Nation. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE-SAVAGE. It is the Savage Nation. Again, if you've just joined us, uh, Donald Trump, in a milestone interview in the next hour, and you're going to listen to it and say, did he really deliver? Did Savage deliver? Did he ask anything no one else has asked? You'll be surprised at the answer you're going to have to give, which is yes. He broke new ground. He made news today. I asked him questions. I wrote out questions. I will see what the answers are going to be. But we're going on a flashback now to January 10th, 2011, because I believe that this was one of the first, if not the first, radio interview about Donald Trump's candidacy. And you see how far back we go. I mean, what year is it? Oh, oh, it's 2016. Savage was interviewing Trump five years ago? Really? And I didn't get permission from the National Review to decide what I should think? So in this interview from 2011, I asked him, are you running for the presidency? Listen now and tell me what you think. There's a lot more we have to cover over the months and, uh, to come. I don't even know if you're running. Are you really ready to run for the presidency, Mr. Trump? Well, I'm a proud American. I love this country. I've never seen anything like what's happening now. I've never seen OPEC go so crazy as they are right now. Oil is now $90 a barrel. It should be 30 I've always been told by a certain very smart friend of mine who's truly an expert on oil that whenever we have oil above 30 and 40, this country has to lose money. And I believe that it was OPEC and I believe it was oil prices that really caused the almost demise. Right, so of as you can our see, he was nation. sitting on the fence back in 2011. He, he changed the question from, from that to OPEC and he talked about the price of oil, which is certainly not a problem today. What is oil at now? $20 a barrel or something? I don't know where it is. How come my gas is not a dollar a gallon? Who's making money now? I mean, if oil's $20 a, a barrel, I should be paying, what, 50 cents to a dollar a gallon of gas? Who's stealing the money? And uh, in 2011, I asked him toward the end of the interview, and Robert, you can play the rest of that, can't you? What is it, a few minutes left? Yeah. Uh, I talk about the uh, United States not having the respect of other nations. And I'm trying to tell you that I have defined for myself Donald Trump as a moderate nationalist. I don't know what he defines himself as. I don't think he needs to be defined. 
But apparently that doesn't pass muster for the elitists who call him every name under the sun because he's not pure enough. I, what I love is that all the people who are attacking Donald Trump as not being a pure enough conservative don't understand that they're actually taking the line of elitists. The very enemies of this country are called elitists. And here you have people who call themselves conservatives who are acting like those elitists themselves by saying Donald Trump is not enough of an elitist for them. Now, I want you to think about that one. So if I can get 65 to 70 percent of what I want out of a candidate, I'd say that's better than zero percent, wouldn't you? Or less than zero from Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. And you want to sit there uh, and say the South will rise again, go ahead and save your Confederate money because I'm sure the South will rise again. Many of you are very much like those who lost the Civil War and you're sitting there and saying, save your Confederate money, the South will rise again. You have lost the war that you are talking about. It's over. The world has changed in front of your eyes. And either you adapt or you die. It's the first rule of survival. Adapt or die. Did I say compromise? No, I said adapt. Those are two different words. I didn't say compromise, I said adapt. Two different words. But it requires a level of language to understand the difference between compromise and adaptation. I guess you need a background in survival to understand what adaptation means. Because political enemies will say that if you're adapting to reality, you're compromising. I would say you're adapting to reality, not compromising. If you want to remain a true believer for whom the bell tolls, go ahead. Be my guest. So again, I want to go back a little bit and review some of the earlier interviews that we did on the Savage Nation. I invite you to call at 855 407 282 while we're waiting for the interview in the next hour. Uh, <clears throat> Robert, you get the next interview ready. Which one is this one uh, going to be from? Because I don't know. I've lost track of which one we're doing. No answer. Okay. Big, big dialogue. I can't hear my callers and I can't hear my board operator. They haven't figured out how to throw the switch yet. M.A., you're on the Savage Nation. Go ahead. Hey, Michael, how you doing? I just wanted to say, uh, I mean, we love, down here in South Carolina, we love Donald Trump. And, I mean, we love Ted Cruz. We love both of them. When, when Trump first came out, you know, said he was going to run, you know, and started talking about immigration, everybody down here loved it. I mean, we loved it. But now, I mean, we got two candidates that we like. We like Cruz because he's a conservative. I don't expect Donald Trump to be a cookie-cutter conservative kind of guy. That's not what he is, but he's electful. A lot of people like him. But if they keep going at each other like they're going at each other, I mean, I think that they're doing more harm than they're doing good. Uh, well, you, you make a very good point. I believe you're 100% you're right. And I said after the first debate when Megyn Kelly set them all off against each other, they shouldn't have taken the bait. They should have attacked Hillary Clinton. That is the number one mistake that the Republican candidates have been making, which is taking the bait of the evildoers in the media. They may look nice because they have blonde hair and blue eyes and they have a shapely figure, but never forget that it's the evil ones in the media who have destroyed America to begin with. And let me tell you something, they're doing a very good job of finish, finishing us off right now by turning the Republicans against each other. They should turn the questions around, refuse to attack each other, and attack Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. That's all they should be doing. No matter what's thrown at them, turn it back on the, on the interviewer. That's what I would do. But uh, I'm not running for office, okay? WMAL, Marty, welcome to the Savage Nation from Washington, D.C. What's on your mind? Oh, I just think that Sanders, the reason people are liking him and uh, he's gonna, and Hillary's going to lose votes to him, is he tells the truth. Just like last night on that town hall, he's going to raise your taxes. People want the truth. And then some young college guy, or he was just out of law school, asked her a question and said people at his generation, his age, think that she's a liar. In, which she is, but that's why. I mean, he's... Good. Well, I'm sure that Hitler told the truth, too. So what, only the truth matters? Well, what is the truth he's telling? That he hates anyone who's done well in America? That he hates America itself? That's all... He's telling the truth. He is. He's telling the truth that... He's telling the truth that the only way he's going to pay for anything is he's going to raise your taxes. And that's... It. Sure, and that appeals to the... That appeals to the... That appeals to the people on welfare. That appeals to illegal immigrants that appeals to kids in college who don't work for a living. So it's very appealing to those who don't uh, work, those who don't pay taxes, and those who live off, off the government uh, largesse. Of course it appeals to them. And those college kids that he's going to get are the ones that believe that 
he's gonna he's gonna erase their. When did when did a college kid ever know anything about reality? What does a college kid know? What do they know? All they know is their emotions. That's all. All they know is partying. That's what they know in college. Right, they, what, what do they know? What do we care what a college kid thinks? What do they know about reality? They live in a microcosm. That's what they live in, where everything's perfect and everybody's nice. Everybody, there's no reality in college. Yeah, that's right. So an idiot, I should say a demagogue, would appeal to them, like uh, old Bernie. Old Bernie, the honest old Bernie. I'll raise the taxes on the evil, filthy rich. That appeals to the college kid who hasn't made a dime yet. Lived on the father or the mother or the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the call. Or perhaps a scholarship. WJR, Dan, welcome to the Savage Nation. What's your topic? Hello, Michael. Yeah, it's about this immigration to Europe. I think one aspect we need to look at more is the gender oh. uh, imbalance it's going to create. These countries are very thin on the 20 to 30-year-old age. They're old countries. And to bring a ton of males in, we're going to have uh, situations like China with dozens and dozens of, of males without uh, any prospect of uh, marriage. Or it's just going to create horrible instability. Well, I can't answer that question, but if you're bringing in unwed males of a military age to a nation... It sort of begs the question as to why you're bringing in males of a military age without families into a nation. Why would you do that? I think to, to take half of the females away, to create uh, instability and chaos. Uh, well, that, there's the old, nice, thin, smoking man in the White House at work, isn't it? Yes. Thank you for the call. So now I want to go back in time. Robert, what's the date of the following uh, interview, the snippet from the Donald Trump previous interviews, please? Of what year? We are now going to take you back in time for a short visit, October 6th, 2015, uh, where Donald Trump was on this show, and I asked him about the TPP deal, which, by the way, Ted Cruz supports. Incidentally, all you pure conservatives, pure as the driven snow, can you explain why Ted Cruz supports something that Obama wanted so badly? Or you've conveniently forgotten that because you're so pure, because you read the National Review? Uh, ben Carson's remarks on Syria. Does he support Putin's incursion into Syria? The possibility of China joining with Russia to fight ISIS? Why did we lose everything we do with Obama? Uh, will he stand up for people who are proud of what they've achieved? I talked about the corruption in science and fake global warming industry. And then I talked with him, strangely enough, saying, I asked him point blank, if you win the presidency, would you appoint me to head the NIH or HHS? I said point blank that I would consider such a job, although I laid in bed last night thinking I could never do it. The thought of flying back and forth to Washington, I swear to God, I went through my head. I said, Michael, you know, you better be careful what you, what you wish for, because what if he wins the presidency and he gives you a call and says, Dr. Savage, Donald Trump is on the phone. Hello, Michael. Michael, we'd like you to come to Washington and run the Department of Health and Human Services. We want you to tighten up welfare. We want you to throw all the fake uh, collectors of disability out. We want you to tighten up the grants and contracts division of the NSF, the NIH. We want all fraud and science stopped. You're the only man we trust to do it. I said, holy God, would I really take a job like that? I swear to you. And then I envisioned myself flying back and forth to Washington which I cannot do. I hate flying, number one. I said, does Nancy Pelosi still use Air Force jets to go back and forth? Remember that scandal of a few years ago? Does Feinstein use Air Force G4s, G5s on the government dime to fly back and forth and reimburse first-class fares? Wow, that's very generous. We have to look into that, Robert. Can someone do a quick Google search listening to the show? Does Nancy Pelosi and Dianne Feinstein still use Air Force jets to fly back and forth to Congress? That's number one. I said, they're not going to give me an Air Force jet to fly back and forth. And so think of the wear and tear. Then I thought of living in an apartment in Washington, like uh, a Ralph Nader type, alone in a room with a dog. That's if Teddy's still living, which I hope he will be. Uh, a year from now, and I said, I don't know if I can do that. Can I start all over again and run the... Then I thought of... I'm telling you exactly what went through my mind. Then I thought of being a bureaucrat, which I've never been in my life, sitting at a desk with a suit and tie, which unto itself is a stress, every day, having to be there every day with a suit and tie. 
and sit at a desk and have meetings from 7 o'clock.